Welcome to GabFest Reads for the month of May. I'm Emily Badlon, one of the hosts of Slate's Political GabFest. I am here today with a wonderful fiction writer, Curtis Sittenfeld. Hey, Curtis. Hey, Emily. Curtis is the author of excellent New York Times bestselling books, the novels that include Eligible and Prep, An American Wife. She has also written for The New Yorker and The New York Times, The Atlantic, Vanity Fair. She's been on This American Life. She deserves to be everywhere. And she is the author of a new novel called Romantic Comedy, which, of course, is a romantic comedy. Could you just tell us a little bit about the premise of this novel and the main characters? Yes. So the main character is a woman named Sally who's in her late 30s and works for a late night sketch comedy show in New York that bears uh, a significant resemblance to Saturday Night Live. And she's, she's worked there for nine years. She writes a sketch kind of making fun of the phenomenon of men dating up generally, like sort of talented but ordinary looking men dating super gorgeous, super successful, world famous women, which happens at the show and also, of course, happens in real life. And she's mocking how this wouldn't really happen with an ordinary woman and a super hot, famous male celebrity. And then that week's guest host um, and musical guest are one and the same, are a, a charming, smoking hot pop singer named Noah. And she thinks there might be chemistry, but is it all in her head or is it real? <laughs> and what intrigued you about this setup? Why were you interested in this idea of, you know, an obvious double standard? You have a lot of fun with uh, one of Sally's friends and another writer and also like host on the show who is like a normal looking guy who is dating a super hot celebrity. And, you know, Sally's like, I wouldn't say she's bitter about it, but she's like really noticing. And I wonder why this was something that intrigued you. By the way, I feel like in general, like not bitter, but noticing could be like a great euphemism <laughs> for, for me to use like going forward. Um, in some ways, I think that I think the biggest reason that I wrote this book is that I thought it would be really fun. Like it, I thought it would be doubly fun to write about people like flirting and falling in love and to set it in like the sketch comedy world. I started it in the summer of 2021, you know, deep into the pandemic. And I had started writing another book that I intended to be short and fun. And it was not short and also not fun. And so this one, like this idea had been in the back of my head. And I thought like, oh, my God, that's as much as there's ever a guarantee with writing a novel. This is guaranteed to be fun to like live in the fictional world. I kept thinking of like a lemon meringue pie when I was reading this book. It just had this light, snackable, uh, delicious quality to it in which you're exploring some serious themes, but you're doing it with a sense of humor and a kind of light touch throughout. So it was really fun to read. One of the questions in the book that's somewhat more serious and I think really interesting is the line between cheese, like cheesiness, And, you know, deep romance, sincere emotion. There's nothing like pop music for making us all think about this line. And I wonder, you know, you have this passage in the book where Noah asks Sally to define cheese for him. Um, And he says, because I still haven't figured it out after two decades where the line is between cheese and emotional extravagance that's acceptable. And I just wonder what you were thinking about there, whether there were examples in your head, whether Noah is supposed to represent cheese or something deeper. I think that cheese is in the eye of the beholder, truly, because... So, you know, my first novel came out 18 years ago, and the one lesson that I've learned over and over is that this is all so subjective. Like, every anything anyone can say about you know, this is now my eighth book, my seventh novel. And it's like, someone could say this, this is cheesy, this is boring, or someone could say this is a delicious lemon meringue pot, you know, and it's like, neither person is really right. And I think I think that's true with cheese. Like, I absolutely without question, like, I enjoy, I might lose all credibility saying this, I enjoy 
listening to like Ed Sheeran songs when they come on the radio. And my children, you know, like sometimes politely and sometimes rudely are basically like change, change the station. (laughs) Um, So it's like, I don't, I mean, there's a few Ed Sheeran songs. Actually, he's a good example because I think he's both. I think he's cheesy and like, you know, moving depending on the song or sometimes within the same song, but it's, I, nobody can define it. Anyone who tells you they can is, you know, lying. I like that answer. One of the other more kind of potent themes in the book is about careerism, what it means to be really devoted to what you do. Sally kind of wrestles with how committed she is to writing sketch comedy, but on the other hand, she like truly is committed. I mean, essentially her marriage broke up so that she could go to New York uh, after she gets this offer to write for TNO slash SNL. And there's a point in the book in which it's like an early moment of connection between Sally and Noah, long before they actually get together. But this idea that she says that the show she works on is the love of her life. Do you feel that way about your work? Were you trying to kind of explore here the idea that like women can feel this way and that's okay? That can even be a good thing? I definitely think women can feel that way and it can be a good thing. I think I think anyone can feel that way and it can be a good thing. I mean, I I certainly feel like there are many ways to make a life. And even though this book has a sort of conventional structure, I don't think Sally herself is particularly aspiring to marriage. And I don't think the book is holding up marriage as like the ultimate goal. But I, I just feel like... I mean, maybe in my 20s, I, I did think probably that if you never got married, it was sad or something. And I'm, I'm like 47 and I totally don't feel that way at all. Like, I, I think the world is like becoming sort, I mean, sort of simultaneously more narrow minded and more open minded. But if you live with your best friend forever, if you live with your parakeet forever, like if, if to have the life you want is great. It doesn't seem, though, that Sally is quite having the life she wants when she's writing for TNO and in this kind of, like, some sex but dateless period of her existence. She seems sort of cut off in some way, although I loved her friendships with a couple of the women comedians on the show. You know, are you portraying her in some ways as, like, kind of incomplete until romance hits her and did you have any mixed feelings about that or am I kind of over reading that portrayal I don't see her as incomplete like I see her as kind of just to be clear the marriage that that doesn't last for her is like an early marriage in her 20s starter marriage classic yeah, a star- starter, a marriage. starter marriage and she's in her late 30s when the book opens but I think that she I don't I don't think she sees her life as incomplete I think she feels almost like she's taking control of her life and kind of said, this thing that I want, I wanted a version of love that is not available to me. And so I've kind of taken these other things, like in my wildest dreams, would I prefer something else? Yes, but I don't, I don't think my wildest dreams are available. And then maybe they are. But I I actually think that's a more widespread question. That's sort of like, what is, what is being realistic and what is being greedy? And I think that can apply to like family. It can apply to jobs. It can apply to love and romance. Like, um, you know, and even even like somebody who has an okay marriage and then maybe thinks like, I want a spectacular marriage, um, maybe with someone else or something, you know, like, or if you have an okay job, are you supposed to be grateful or are you supposed to aspire to more? And I don't, it's interesting because a lot of the questions you're asking, I think absolutely these are questions in the book. I don't think they're really answered because I don't think they're answerable. Like I think the book's like kind of exploring them, but not resolving them. One of the, I thought, bold moves you made was to call this book romantic comedy. And I was wondering why you made that choice. It's sort of like a billboard for your intentions and could have a kind of double meaning, but Obviously, many things are romantic comedies. There's a few reasons why why I made the decision. One is um, that my original idea for the book was my family was watching a lot of Saturday Night Live during the pandemic. And I thought to myself, someone should write a screenplay for a romantic comedy about this phenomenon of essentially like SNL men dating up. And the star of it should be, you know, a woman who writes for a show like SNL. And then a few months passed and I thought, oh, that screenplay for the romantic comedy should be a novel and that someone who writes it should be me. So it's it always had these 
kind of romantic comedy origins. And then some of the other titles I considered were um, in the book, Sally mentions that she and the Night Owls are the same age. They were both born in 1981. And so I thought it could be called like the 36th season or the 38th season, like having to do with her age. Or I thought it could be called the Danny Horst rule, which is, you know, Danny Horst is her colleague who who inspires her, his, his dating this gorgeous um, actress inspires her to write the sketch. And I was talking to some writer friends and I said, these are the titles I'm considering. And when I said romantic comedy, a friend of mine said, inject it into my veins. And I was like, okay, I, th- I think we have a clear winner. <laughs> Got it. One of the things I was thinking about with this book, I think especially because of the title, was whether you were playing off romantic comedies of the past, like in, in any particular way. Your book Eligible is a kind of modern reading or retelling of Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. And I was wondering if you had an analog like that in your head or whether it was more the genre as a whole. I think it's more the genre as a whole. So I read romances starting in like fourth grade, what used to be called bodice rippers. I read Harlequins. I was born in 1975. So I was a teenager when a lot of the movies like When Harry Met Sally or Say Anything, like a lot of classic rom-coms came out. I saw, you know, all the like Four Weddings and a Funeral, Notting Hill, like saw those in the theater. Um, So it's like, I feel like... um, I mean, I, I love the form, especially when it's well done. It not I, like I might, I might settle for it not being well done, depending on my mood. Um, but it, I don't think there was any particular model for this. But I, I do, I think that like the structure and the rhythm of rom coms is inside me and has been from a young age, just without my needing to like clinically study it. One of the things I was thinking about was You've Got Mail, uh, the Nora Ephron written movie, because there's a whole epistolary email section of this book, which I thought was like one of the really fun parts of the book, partly because they're using email, which seems kind of hilariously archaic in some ways. But then the date and timestamps become part of the intrigue of that section because you want to think about like how quickly they're responding to each other. And I guess I was just wondering what you were up to with switching to that form. I mean, so You've Got Mail is another movie that I saw in the theater. I didn't I didn't study it, you know, in terms of this. But again, it's like Nora Ephron is in my bloodstream. Like I, I you know, probably have seen m- maybe every movie she made. Um, yeah. And the letter thing was super fun. Like I told my editor that I was going to do that. And I, I think that, you know, or like my agent, and I think they're super supportive and kind and smart. And I think they were kind of like... We look forward to seeing what you do. But I think there was good a, luck. Chris. Yeah, I know. I think there was like a hint of skepticism, and and I think it is. It's actually been super fun because it turns out that whatever novel you write, you become like a magnet for people making confessions about that topic. And so the the confessions that I'm kind of eliciting based on this book are usually it's like middle aged women's opinions on how attracted they are or not to Pete Davidson. (laughs) That's one thing. And then has this person ever had essentially like an email romance that either thrived or tanked, you know, in reality. And are some of those email romances supposed to be kind of furtive and secretive and maybe like cheating on your partner because you know sometimes when you think of people going online it's in that more deceptive way whereas what's happening here is with people who are totally unattached and in that sense it's very innocent right right i mean i think no one has confessed that to me yet (laughs) but i mean you know oh the book is young (laughs) yeah exactly exactly One of the things I appreciated about the book is the way you work through and describe Sally's physicality and appearance. So she's supposed to be not stunningly beautiful, like kind of normal, probably perfectly attractive. 
there are moments in which you are more explicit about her thinking about her own body, like before she actually gets to see Noah during the pandemic. She makes sure to get out her razor, or, like deal with all the unsightly, hairy parts of her body that have not seen the light and day in ages. There's another really funny, very specific detail when she's in a car and she has to lean in and he's behind her and she makes sure not to stick out her butt, which I'm sure like many women will totally identify with um, and maybe some men too. Are you trying to make her seem very normal in those moments or is there sort of something else going on about how women are self-conscious in the way that they present themselves that, you know, can often be just much more time-consuming and kind of burdensome than I think a lot of men experience their bodies? I think it's all of the above. I mean, for me, it's, there's something so strange about the physicality of being human, and it's often glossed over in fiction and in movies. I mean, I actually think it's things are like a lot more explicit on that front now than they were 20 or 30 years ago. But but there is something so weird where especially if you're spending a lot of time with another person, I mean, like your stomach grumbles and like that's the least, <laughs> you know, like and I don't know, there's just there's just something that's so at odds about being a human in a human body and then the kind of front that we present like on social media or where wherever. And I think I'm very I'm interested in the discrepancy between like the public and private and what you let other people see and what you try to conceal. And I think that's some of that has to do with, you know, being a woman and trying to be attractive. And then some of it just has to do with being a person. Yeah. I mean, there's also a point in the book where she's being really careful about where she's going to the bathroom in this very deliberate way. And, you know, I remember growing up when I just read constantly, I would notice that nobody ever Peter pooped. Like, that's just not a thing that happened in novels. Like, really, people yeah. really eat. It's as if yeah, that whole, yeah. like, very quotidian constant part of our existences is kind of off the table. And you're obviously not going, like, super down the, you know, scatological uh, path in this book, but there are these hints of it, and that seemed deliberate. Getting back to the question you asked earlier about, like, what is cheesiness? It's also, like, so I think some people are like, why on earth would you ever depict a character in the bathroom? And I'm kind of like, why on earth wouldn't you? Not to be too explicit, but, but when you're like, oh, you know, books often don't depict, like, eating, peeing, or pooping. If you did not eat, pee, or poop in a day, you'd certainly notice. You'd probably be in the hospital pretty soon. So it's so weird that we depict somebody, like, parasailing or, like, all these exceptional experiences. Experiences and the stuff that like makes up our life is sort of shied away from. The character of Noah is the sort of secondary character in the book, but he obviously is supposed to be very human in his own way, not just like a pop star celebrity. And we see, you know, some moments of vulnerability. I think he especially comes alive in his emails. Was it hard to write from the point of view of a celebrity pop star? Like, did you find yourself sort of inevitably alienated from him? And even as you were trying to be in his head. Do you feel like um, a 47-year-old Minnesotan novelist is different from a, from a smoking hot male pop singer? Um, I don't know. I don't know what you're getting <laughs> at, Emily. No. Uh, I mean, again, I, I think that one of the things that he's trying to convey to Sally is, yes, I am famous, but I am a person. Like, I am not an image. I do not exist only when I'm being photographed or, or performing. Like, I exist when I'm eating a sandwich in my kitchen, although he probably doesn't eat bread, actually. But so, no. I mean, it's the funny thing is, I'm one of four siblings, so I, I would not say I had, like, a lonely childhood. But growing up, I, I would sometimes, like, want to play checkers or want to play Scrabble, and no one wanted to play. And so I would sometimes be, like, the black checkers and then, like, go around to the other side of the board and be the red checkers and then go back and be the black checkers. And that's how I felt writing those emails. Like, I was like... I'm Sally. Now I'm Noah. Now I'm Sally. Like, and I, I kind of, like, sometimes I jump around in chronology when I write, but I couldn't because they had to really respond to what the other person was saying. Like, I had to go email by email, and it was fun. Do you believe his attraction to Sally? I mean, there are several times in the book where he, like, emphatically says, I'm super attracted to you, and she has trouble believing it, and I think we as the reader are sort of set up to be skeptical. Do you believe him? 
Yes. So I think, I mean, I think he's actually honest and says something borderline insulting, which is if I saw a picture of you, I wouldn't pick you out and be like, I've never seen a woman so beautiful. But but I think I think partly because he's approaching 40, he's dated a lot, he hasn't found a connection. I think there maybe is something about the fact that he could definitely date a super gorgeous woman if he wanted to, many super gorgeous women. And he doesn't need that to like prove something about himself to himself. And then also not to give too much of a spoiler, but they ultimately like have great sex. And and then once those sex hormones are coursing through you, like, you know, I, th- I think you're able to see the other person as fairly attractive. <laughs> well, since you brought that up, I feel better about the last question I want to ask you is this book is really not about if people are going to get together. It's more about how they're going to get together, which is like pretty typical for romantic comedies, right? I mean, there are moments when people separate and things seem hopeless, but we have the expectation that in the end, they're going to figure things out. Did you feel like you had that idea all along? Did you want it to be more uncertain? Was there ever some moment where you thought, like, I'm just going to blow this up on these people and it's actually not going to be a romantic comedy? After all, it's going to be a very sad, gloomy tragedy. (laughs) Romantic, yeah, romantic tragedy or unromantic comedy. I mean, people, especially in the romance community, talk about, like, the HEA or the happily ever after. I, I, this is sort of a, maybe a strange way of answering your question, but Having written this book made me step back and kind of analyze Saturday Night Live. And one of the things that I thought about that's very obvious, but I had never considered it, is I think one of the things that makes Saturday Night Live awesome is the tension between it has this super fixed structure, but it's live. So all manner of things can go wrong or like you don't you know there's going to be a sketch, but you don't know what's in the sketch and you know there's going to be the musical performance and then then there's other musical performance and I kind of feel that way about the book that it's I think you probably can guess that you know it's a comfort read it's supposed to be delicious and fun and I I don't want to I mean like people people can find their sort of darkness and devastation in so many other places right now so it's like I don't want to add to that but I think there still should be surprises and suspense and like good tension sexual tension in terms of how you get there Yeah I totally agree with that and you're right that like part of the appeal really of any live TV but maybe especially Saturday Night Night Live is that something could go wrong at any moment and throw things off course and I think you write about that but you know if you're a regular watcher of the show you see that happen um Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, whether it's, like, someone's mustache falls off, or it's, like, people actually love when the actors break and laugh. It's almost like it enhances the the sketches. And and I think some of that is, like, oh, they're, they're human. Like, if I were on SNL, like, I'd be laughing, too. Like, this is so endearing. Yeah, like, it's totally exciting and fun that anything can happen. Does Sally write a great movie? Is that her, her future? <laughs> <laughs> you get to decide, Emily. That, that's yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't think I'll write a sequel. But like, why not? Why shouldn't she? I'll, I'll sort of refrain, even though I'm so tempted to like spoil it. But by the end, you find out she has written a movie that's not a romantic comedy, but kind of is a romance. I think. But I won't get more specific than that. I think that's a good, intriguing note to end on. The book is Romantic Comedy by Curtis Sittenfeld. Um, It is just a delectable spring, summer, any season read. Curtis, thanks so much for talking about the book with me. Thank you, Emily. That's it for this month's edition of GabFest Reads. Our producer is Shana Roth, Ben Richmond, Senior Director of Operations of Podcasts. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio at Slate. We'll be back next month with another edition of GabFest Reads. Until then, all three of us, David and John and me, will be back in your feed on Thursday with a new episode of Slate Political Gap Fest. Thanks for listening. <laughs>